Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for Math 095, Basic Algebra. In this video, we're going to look at section 6.6, .6, but this is part two, continuing from uh, the previous video. And we're basically going to uh, look at more concepts of functions. Now, we have already defined the difference between a function and a relation. They're both correspondence, but there is a difference. Now, if we look at these three different graphs, we can determine whether they're a function or a relation using a new tool. But if we first look at it, let's just kind of take what we know from this. If I see this uh, graph here, I know that that's a, an equation of a line. It is just a straight line that has a slope. It's increasing from left to right. So I would know that that slope is positive. If I look at this and say, well, that kind of looks like a circle. So you know, I know my shapes pretty well. So that's a circle. And this here, well, I've seen this before. I know that this is a vertical line. And this is a special type of line. If we recall, its slope is undefined. So this would be x equals some number. Let's just call it b, because we don't have any scale on here. So now that we've seen these, well, which one of these are functions? Well, a function is defined for each value of x. There is, it corresponds to only one y. So this x corresponds to only one y. There's no other value that x corresponds to. So if I wrote this as an ordered pair, it'd be x, y. Uh, so the only one point comes from one input. And that's good. That means that this would be a function. No matter what value of x I choose, I'm only going to get one value of y. So this is a function. So I've determined, yes, this is a function. Well, what about this? Let's say I choose a value for x. And it would correspond to a point here, but it would also correspond to a point down here. So for this input, I would have x, y, and the same x for another y. The x value repeats. This is not a function. It is only a relation. Now, what about this? We know this is a line, but is it a function? All the other lines were functions. What about this one? Well, if x is always the same value, if I say, well, what is the y value for this x value here, I would have a point x, y. But I'd also have that point if I chose down here a different y value. This x corresponds to many different y's, actually an infinite number of y's. So the x repeats not just twice, but an infinite number of times. This is not a function. When we have a, hor or a vertical line, vertical lines are not functions. It is the only line that is not a function. And for that reason, we can actually use this as our tool to determine whether we have a function when looking at a graph. If we look at this, I can take a vertical line. And anywhere I draw a vertical line, it only intersects the graph one time. That tells me that the x doesn't repeat. If I draw a vertical line over here, it only intersects the graph one time. So if I can place a vertical line anywhere on this graph, and it only intersects it once, no matter where I place it, it is a function. What if I used a vertical line over here? Well, if I use a vertical line here, we can see that, uh-oh, it intersects it in more than one place. That tells me immediately that this is not a function. And of course, if I lay a vertical line over a vertical line, it doesn't intersect it just once. It actually intersects it an infinite number of places. So <clears throat> we can use this as our tool. Let's look at a couple of graphs here. The first thing we want to do is determine, are these functions? Well, if I use a vertical line, no matter where I place a vertical line for this graph, it only intersects it once, no matter where I place it. So this is a function. And we know that all our lines, except that vertical line, is a function. This is not a vertical line, but it is a line. It is a function. What about this one here? Well, this one, we may have never seen a graph like this before. But hopefully, we're somewhat familiar with square roots. If I use the vertical line, well, it only intersects at one place no matter where I put it. So this, too, is a function. So both of these are functions. They passed our vertical line test. Now, what if I wanted to determine the domain and range of these functions? Well, by looking at the graph, we can see, well, I can put in a value for x. And this is going to decrease in y. 
So no matter where I go in x, I'm going to get out a y value. This arrow indicates that it just continues on in this direction for infinity. Well, same thing over here. If I put in negative values of x, this is just going to continue on for infinity. So my domain here is I can put in any value of x. So its domain is all real values. But let's write it in interval notation from negative infinity to infinity. Well, we can also determine its range. If I look at it, this arrow continues up forever, and it continues down forever to infinities. And we write them from least to greatest. So our range, because that continues in a downward fashion and an upward fashion, we can say the range is also all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, and unless it's specified to write it in interval notation, this symbol works just as well. But most of, uh, most of the time, we're going to write it in interval notation. Let's look at this one here. Now, if we look at this, this one doesn't continue on forever in this direction, but it does kind of go off in that direction. So it has some restrictions here. To determine what those restrictions are, well, to look at the graph, we can say, well, it looks like there is a value at the origin. And it continues off to the right. Well, what values in terms of domain are to the right of 0? Well, that would be all of my positive values for x. And it includes 0. So I can say, well, it includes 0, and then it goes off to the right. Well, going off to the right is to positive infinity. So the domain where I find a piece of my graph will be from 0 to infinity. Now notice, there isn't any piece of the graph over here, so there's no domain that contains the negative values. What about range? Well, by looking at the graph, we can determine the range by saying, when we write domains and ranges, we write them from least to greatest. What is my smallest y value? Well, it looks like it's right on the x-axis. It's at the origin, so that would be 0. 0 is the lowest value on the graph. And it continues up in a slightly upward manner. So as x goes to infinity, I'm sure y continues on forever. Now, in these two examples, our domains and ranges were the same. These two were the same, and these two were the same. It won't always be that way. One example is maybe we have a graph that looks like this. This would have a domain of all real numbers. As x gets really big or x gets really negative, it continues up in the y direction. The lowest y value would be here. So my domain would be all reals, but my y would be from this value to infinity. So they can differ, even though my examples did not. Let's take a look at this here. Now, for this level of algebra, we can determine the range from a graph, but we're really not ready to determine the range from the function itself. So I'm just going to ask you to determine the domain given the function. So <clears throat> notice we have function notation again. Here we have f of x equals 2x plus 3. And hopefully we recognize that as a line in slope-intercept form. And it's not a vertical line, so I know its domain is going to be all real values from negative infinity to positive infinity because I can put in any value of x and do the math to get some value of y. What about this one here? Now, this is not linear because we have an x in the denominator. What do we know about denominators? We should know that we can never divide by 0. Never divide by 0. So I have a domain restriction. If this is 0, then it is not a real value. It's not something I can work with. So this value, I set the denominator equal to 0 and solve for x. Well, I can solve for x by adding x to both sides. And I get 4 equals x. So this is my domain restriction, because we know that the denominator cannot equal 0. So this says that x cannot equal 4. How do I write that in interval notation? Well, I can have values from negative infinity up to 4. But I cannot include 4. And I can have values from 4 to positive infinity, but it doesn't include 4. And because I have more than one interval, I have to write union, use that symbol again. Hopefully, we remember that from previous videos in this chapter. So this would be the domain, all values excluding 
for the union of these two intervals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this one for you. But before I do that, I want you to look at this graph. When we have a square root, notice the graph doesn't go below 0 for the input values, the x values. The domain was from 0 to infinity. And it included 0. We can take the square root of 0. But what we can't take the square root of is a negative value. So if we can't take a square, uh, the square root of a negative value, there will be no negative values. So that's a domain restriction. And that's why our domain was from 0 to infinity. Well, when we had something in the denominator, our denominator can equal 0. So what you have to look at is what the value here, because it's a square root and it's in the denominator, whatever this value is has to be greater than 0. Because it can't be less than 0, and it can't be equal to 0. That leaves us with being greater than 0. So if you solve this equation, you'll have the domain. Write it in interval notation. All right, one last example for this uh, section. We have an application where the cost in dollars for renting a car, because maybe sometime uh, we might be traveling and we have to rent a car. Uh, this cost is given by the linear function c of x equals 0.2x plus 24, where we can see this is our function notation. And we use this symbol because it's representing a cost, right? So, and the x, where x is the number of miles driven. If you rent a car, they're going to charge you an amount of money. And then they're going to charge you for every mile you put on the car. This is what that models. They're going to charge you $24. And then they're going to charge you $0.20 cents every mile. x is the number of miles driven. So this is our cost function. And then we're asked to find the cost of driving 2,000 miles. This is the x value. This is the input value. So I can write c of 2,000. What's the cost of driving 2,000 miles? So I'm going to take my function with my function notation, and I'm going to put this value in for x. All right, and now I can figure out what it's going to cost me to drive 2,000 miles renting this car. So I just do some simplification. 0.2 times 2,000 is going to be 400 plus 24. And I find c of 2,000 is 400 plus 24 is 424. Now, we're not done because this is an application. Even though it looks like we're done, we have to realize that this is an application. It has units. We have to explain to the reader or our instructor what exactly this number means. It will cost $424 to drive 2,000 miles. So we explained it in the units of dollars and miles. That's what the cost function represented. So this has been section 6.6, .6, part two. Thank you for watching.